So moving on, uh, we're now sliding into our uh, Columbia Business School sort of alumni portion of things. And I'm really happy to be connecting uh, one of our alums, uh, Emily Culp, uh, 06, who is the CEO of CoverFX uh, and should feel, to, should feel free to uh, come on stage, uh, as well as very happy to have our student, uh, Farrell Hannafin, um, great, excellent, who is one of uh, the MAC leadership, uh, who is going to come on and uh, begin this discussion and move forward with Emily. So I leave it to you to take it away. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Farrell Hannafin. I'm a second year at CBS. And uh, like Matt said, I'm on the board of the Marketing Association at Columbia. Over the summer, I interned in beauty and I'll be returning next year. So I'm very passionate about the industry, uh, which is why I'm so excited to be here with Emily Culp, the CEO of CoverFX. So Emily, I'll pass it over to you to um, give a quick note on your background and then present your insights on our conference theme of the future of marketing leadership. Thank you very much, Matt and Farrell. And also, uh, I really enjoyed hearing Fernando as well. So always a pleasure to be here. And I have to say, I love my alma mater. So thank you. Um, as Farrell mentioned, I'm the CEO of Cover Effects. For those of you who don't know our brand, we're a high performance clean beauty brand that works for all skin tones and skin types. And just a little bit more context around my background. Uh, prior to being CEO, I was fortunate enough to be the CMO of Keds, the sneaker company. And then prior to that, worked at Rebecca Minkoff and an omni-channel global role. And then speeding through my career, spent the first 10 years of my career at a phenomenal stage when e-commerce and digital marketing were still nascent. Uh, just to date myself, this is when uh, display banners still got 99% uh, percent click through. So a really exciting pioneering time. Um, today, as Matt said, what we're focusing on is what does it take to be a really strong marketing leader? And I think if I was going to summarize it, there are obviously a number of different attributes, but the three that I think are really, really important for marketing leadership, one is around creative problem solving, which I'll be touching on today, which can take in the form, if you will, of innovation. The second is accountability. And with this, I think uh, what's really important to me that all marketers hold near and dear is every single marketing action should be something that is tied to a KPI and is measurable in some capacity. Even if uh, it's a number of different assumptions, there should always be some type of model behind some type of action. So I think that's very exciting. That leads to my third uh, focal area for marketers. I would say it's financial acumen. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, the closer you are with your CFO, uh, the better. And I think the more fluency that you have on reading whether it's a 13 week cash flow to your PL to what have you, that will make you a better leader and also prepare uh, your team to win in the marketplace. So, with all of that, I'm excited to share with you just a few thoughts around how Cover Effects, how we've addressed some of the variability in the marketplace, especially with COVID and many of the other social movements that have been going on. So I will present a few slides. So if we could cue those up. So as I mentioned, what I will be talking about is developing innovation and KPIs to solve consumer challenges. Next slide, please. So in my mind, the most important thing before you innovate or anything is putting your consumer at the heart of everything you do. And for us during this really uncertain time, we went back to where is our consumer and what do they need? And we thought about the fact that they wanna discover new products that address their current life, which by the way, is a very different life than just three, four, five months ago. The second need that they have is how do I find my shade in a world where I can't actually touch or try on any of these products? 
As many of you know, in makeup, it's a very personal experience to find your own foundation color, to try on products, and it's very tactile. So this was a challenge for us. Next slide. So I'm gonna to touch on three different types of innovation. The first type I'll talk about is around products. Going back to where is our consumer right now? What is she or he concerned about? They're thinking about how do I find something that's easy to use and saves me time? Because my life is actually more chaotic right now and I need help. So that's where we looked very thoughtfully at our product innovation calendar and thought about the fact that increasingly consumers are looking for skincare plus makeup solutions. You don't want necessarily always two products. You want one that's really going to work hard for you and is multitasking. So we launched this luminous tinted moisturizer. It has pre and probiotics. It blurs pores. It fine lines, creates this beautiful, I'm wearing it right now, radiant look. And it also restores the skin's barrier. Because when you think about right now, so many of us are under stressful times actually one of the largest organs in our body is our skin and it's the first place to show and process stress so this is a product that helps with that secondly we started to hear uh, a lot of questions from consumers where they were like we need to get ready in what they called zoom ready in five minutes what do i do how do i make this quickly this was an amazing insight for us on innovation and we have launched this patent pending brush I'm going to see if it remotely, if you guys, oh, there we go. Three little wells, you can see it's fabulous. Why this is so fun is this solves one of the other challenges. Consumers were like, how much product do I put on? I don't want to do multiple steps. So now you can put luminous tinted moisturizer. You could put a blue, we have a product called Water Cloud, which really helps your skin protect against blue light, which by the way is emitted from every screen that we're all tethered to, so extremely important. And then you could also put in another one of our products called CCDs, which is a high pigment foundation. And then you think about it, you've dropped all of this in, you just go like this, literally swirl it around your face and you're ready in five minutes or less and zoom appropriate. So for us, this was also another way that we could help our consumers and bring innovation forth to the marketplace. Next slide, please. Innovation for us too was not just about new products, but it was also thinking about, again, where is our consumer's mindset? One of the things that has been really interesting to us because we've been talking to our consumers, we have about 1.25 million consumers to engage with on Instagram, which is quite a number. And we've learned that a majority of them, about 75% of our consumers consider themselves super creative, which is really fun to try and tap into right now when people are looking for moments of joy. So for us, we wanted to power this creativity through customization. One of our core products that's been out for about over a year is our blush. It has two sides. One is matte, one is shimmer. That allows somebody to customize the look. But for us, again, it was thinking about how do we do something that's time-saving, also fun. So we launched with correlating or monochromatic color lip that also matches the blush. So now somebody, again, thinking about getting ready for Zoom in five minutes, they can use the brush, get all of the canvas of the face ready, put on the blush, put it as eyeshadow as well, and have the lip and have a completely ready to go look. And that's something that our consumer was asking for. Next slide, please. So a key part that we need to acknowledge right now, at least within the beauty industry, is you know we have all these fabulous products, but she can't go here and she can't touch the products. And by the way, in many states, you know they, people can't even go into store. And the states where they can go into store, this entire gondola or shelf display now actually has other saran wrap, if you will, or clear uh, units over it. So neither the consumer or the beauty advisor can touch the product, but she can at least see it. Next slide, please. So for us, going back to, we have these great new products that are solving these amazing insights or questions that our consumer has or challenges. Now we're trying to figure out what kind of innovation as it pertains to technology 
that can help the fact that they want to try the products, but they physically can't touch them. Enter in the idea of using Instagram filters. As we know, we have about 1.2 million people on Instagram. This is a great way for our consumer to test our new lip product or different things. So we launched Instagram filters. But we also acknowledge that not all of our global consumers want to be on Instagram. So we also put on our website, which we consider the purest expression of our brand, a virtual try-on tool. Where this was really exciting is it's fully customizable to our brand. Most tools, AI and AR tools right now in the beauty world have about 85 points to track your face. For us, that still wasn't enough. And I think if many of you might recall, you know, many try on tools, if you've done beauty or fashion early in your career, it almost looked like clip art when you tried to put the color on, it didn't quite map to your face. So it wasn't a great experience. So we went with a company that could take the industry standard of about 85 touch points and bring it up to 209. So that's how you can see right now, either our, our consumer, maybe they don't want to upload a picture of themselves, but they want to see how the blush and also the lip looks on somebody who maybe looks like them. So those are some influencers that they can try it on, or maybe they do want to upload a picture of themselves. And the redhead there is a lovely woman, Melissa, who works at our company and she uploaded her picture and then is trying on her product. So this is a way that technology enabled us to solve a pain point for our consumer. Next slide, please. Another form of technology innovation for us was frankly trying to solve for, in beauty, a lot of what we do is creating photography, beautiful, rich photography assets, whether it's with models, influencers, product shots, et cetera. During COVID, this wasn't possible. I would never want my uh, team to be in an unsafe environment. So even shooting still life didn't seem like a good idea. Hence, we turned to CGI. So the imagery all over to the left is actually completely computer generated, which for us was, you know, very exciting to see the quality because again, within beauty, it's around the texture, the richness, the shades, et cetera. So thrilled that CGI has been brought into our mix as marketers. And then finally, going back to one of the points that I said before, it's really for us, you know, how do you leverage technology to also empower that consumer to be creative, to learn something and actually have a bit of fun. So we also use technology. This is static right now, but we actually have recipes, if you will. Going back to the brush that I talked about, it's showing them how to use the different products in an animated and engaging way that hopefully will help them um, try our products, which is key. Next slide, please. A third part of innovation to me, and this is the one that usually doesn't get as much uh, time because it's not quite as shiny as technology and other things, but is process and timing. I think this really should never be overlooked. So what these two images correlate to, the first one um, with all the beautiful women who are influencers and the rich pigment, that is actually showing that we decided for our lip launch, given how COVID was rolling out in the country and when our product was ready, was to launch it fully online first. And that for us was a new way to go to market it also was really exciting because it enabled us to get more ratings and reviews, hear from our consumer about what they loved, also to get, gather more data on which colors were going to spike as it then rolled into wholesale, meaning into hundreds of doors with Ulta and other partners across the world. Um, so that was exciting. That was one change in process. The second one is we really um, pivoted quite quickly and made sure that we had sampling. Again, noting the fact that we want to be cognizant not only of the in-store consumer, but also the consumer who's shopping online, there's a lot of risk on, is this the right color for me or not? So we created sampling packets. So then consumers can at least try this, whether it's through a D to C experience or wholesale, try before they buy, which helps them feel comfortable and also helps us mitigate returns. Next slide, please. 
So in summary, three types of innovation. And here are, there are so many more KPIs, but for the purposes of not overwhelming you with all the KPIs, here are some core ones that I think are worth noting. In product innovation, it's really important to think about, of course, revenue that pertains to your own D2C channels. But when you start to think about wholesale, it's important to think about sell through and productivity in store by square foot. It's also very important, I think, to really look at the volume and the quality and the star rating of ratings and reviews. That's a very positive way to get an indicator on how your product will trend, whether it's in the short term or the velocity for the long term. And then finally, press coverage. So it's not about generating billions of um, impressions. In my mind, it's about the quality, getting the editorial coverage that you want that ties back into brand heat that fuels this whole cycle. Moving over to new technology, the key KPIs there for me, again, revenue and sell through. I think what's also really interesting in technology, because usually this is all within one closed ecosystem, you can also start to correlate it back to increase in a brand search. So that is really helpful. If you launch a new tool, then you start to see search um, spikes and depending on different words come up, which is really interesting and helps you rethink about how to remarket to consumers. Finally, it's also around email database growth and social engagement. Depending on, for example, our Instagram filter, that enabled us to immediately correlate to how much engagement we were getting in that particular channel. And then finally, one that's also really important with new technology, at least the ones that I covered, is content. So one of the best things out of the technology that we introduced was you think about it, people are taking, uh, whether it's in Instagram or online, and if they choose to share it, photographs trying on the product, what better way to have our consumers feel engaged and start to connect that, oh, that person looks like me, or I love what they did, I hadn't thought about that. So now we're getting content from our consumers, which helps us market even further. Finally, the third type of innovation is around the new process that we talked about. A good way to measure that is increase in brand awareness. There are multiple different ways to do that that I'd be happy to get into. Second is around driving conversion. Uh, this is something that's easier to do or to measure when you're looking at your own D2C channels, whether it's a mono brand store or your website. And then finally, in both channels, when we're doing things like sampling, the objective would be to minimize returns. So you can benchmark it against other color launches and see how the investment in sampling could help mitigate returns. Next slide, please. So in summary, I think of innovation in three ways. One is product. The second is technology. The third is process. All of these should ladder back to a return on investment, going back to the KPIs and to be able to really make a case for every dollar spent of working capital. But at the core of everything that you do, regardless of whatever type of innovation, to me, the key is to make sure that you're solving a true consumer challenge. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Emily. That um, was so inspiring to see how CoverFX has um, really innovated during COVID and um, how successful you've been. Um, so with that said, we have a few questions for you and then we'll open it up to the audience. So the first is um, diving deeper into um, the innovation component of your talk. Um, so you spoke a lot about how focusing on a consumer problem that you're solving is really key when innovating. Um, but one thing that's so remarkable is how you did this under such a um, short period of time. And so what are best practices that leaders can learn um, from your examples to innovate quickly and successfully around consumer problems? I think um, there are a number of different things. One is it, number one ingredient, you need an amazing team. I am so blessed that I have a phenomenal team. So you need a team who is open-minded um, to absorbing all these consumer insights, macroeconomic trends, all of it, being able to process it, and then to have the agility and frankly, the drive and the passion to say, we can do this. We're excited to do this. We know what the path forward looks like and let's do this and commit to it. So I would say team is number one. 
I would say number two, it's about consistency of communication, both internally and externally, um, making sure that everybody's aligned on what does success look like and what is the timeline accordingly. Um, the other key parts I would say, at least as a CEO, it's really going back to, as I said, understanding having that financial acumen, understanding what you can afford to do um, and when. And then the last component is really having a mastery of your supply chain because you can have the best ideas in the world and you can have the best technology in the world. But if you can't get the, pro the product out on time, or in a way that you want, it won't come to fruition. So it's also making sure that you have full the full purview to understand how your entire company works. Great. Um, we also want to touch on omni-channel retail, um, knowing that you have really worked a lot in omni-retail beyond cover effects and also at KEDS and Rebecca Minkoff. How have emerging technologies impacted omni-channel retail and what is your advice for companies developing omni-channel retails during this current moment that we're in? It's so funny. I mean, I love innovation as you know, and um, Matt knows this too. I mean, I really love innovation and being cutting edge. It, COVID has been, it's been one of those moments where yes, like AI, AR that I talked about, like the virtual try -on, that is pretty innovative, or at least getting it done well. So those types of things, I think, continue to be very relevant. But I'd also say on the other end of the spectrum, it's almost going back to primitive times. And if I can give you like a few examples to illustrate, one is ratings and reviews are not anything innovative per se. They've been around for quite some time. But right now, if you're an omni-channel retailer, you think about your consumer may or may not be able to go into your store. So what does their journey look like? They're looking possibly on your social media um, presence, wherever that may be. They're looking on your website. Maybe they're going to Amazon because that's used so much more than Google even these days on searching products. Ratings and reviews are critical. There's a reason why Wall Street Journal just did a whole piece on this. And it only validates what we've all known, but I can't say enough on making sure you have those in place for products. So for example, consumers actually trust a four star more than a five star because they actually think there's more credibility because if you have a total five star, it feels like maybe these aren't true consumers reviewing this, nothing's perfect. So they trust the four star. Another insight to me that's been really interesting, and we've seen this as well, is consumers trust mobile reviews far more than desktop. Because their point is there's more effort. Think about it. It's more effort typing on your phone, even if it's short, but you care enough to spend that next nanosecond to fill it out. And you're doing it almost real time right after you had an experience with the product. And then finally, it's critical to actually have negative reviews. I believe this my whole career, but it's always nice when there's confirmation from other sources. And the reason why it's critical to have the negative reviews is it goes back to credibility and is the company honest? So if a company has a negative review, for example, for us, it could say, this blush is so peachy. That could get a one star. Well, guess what? You're a consumer who wants a peach blush. So you can interpret that and understand, okay, I still want this product. But you also note now and trust our brand, we didn't uh, remove that rating, which is really important from a credibility standpoint. Going back to one or two other, so ratings and reviews, super important, not super innovative, but really important. Another one I think that's really important is um, we're seeing something that I've actually never seen before, and I attribute this definitely to COVID, is with one of our key partners, Ulta, we're seeing our consumers go into the Ulta doors to look at the products. Remember, they can't actually touch them, but they get to see them closer. Go in, maybe get a sample, then they actually want to buy it, but they stand in the store and buy it on the Ulta app or go to our website. They don't actually want to buy it from the cash wrap. So we've had some of our beauty advisors um, who work at CoverFX and work with Ulta ask them, like, could you tell us how you're like, what is your thought process? And their point is they don't actually want to touch anything another person has touched. So they want contactless, but they actually weirdly want a social experience 
they don't just want to do this all from their home. So I'm not saying these are congruent, by the way, they are not, but they want to be around other people and get that energy of social shopping, but they don't want to have to touch anything that other people had. And then finally, um, they don't want to wait in line. They, they're now, everybody's been, it, things come to me in nanoseconds. It can just come to my house. I don't want to wait four minutes in line. So that's a totally new behavior, I would say, that's happening. And then finally, I would say, just going back to reimagining the store experience, and this is going back to almost my primitive comment. So if you can imagine, we are trying to figure out how our beauty advisors can help somebody find a perfect foundation. We can't touch them. We can't put the product on our beauty advisor. So what we've come up with is using acrylic little sheets with swatches of our foundation colors that they can pick up by themselves and almost like paint swatching with their face, figure out what color they are. This is not some breakthrough technology, but we're trying to, again, be creative on solving a consumer pain point. So those are some interesting different insights that I think are fun. That's great. And it's so apparent that Cover FX has um, just such a close relationship with your customer and um, customer feedback, um, which I think is, is something important for us to take away. Um, so we are now gonna open it up to some audience questions. Um, so the first from our audience is, have you contemplated sending samples to customers and what are the what's the experience versus the cost trade-offs you consider? Ooh, this is someone who's savvy. I mean, in my perfect world, sure. I'd send uh, samples to everybody for every product we have. Samples are expensive and the margins are usually not attractive. Um, to answer this person's question, yes, we, we're not sending them to everybody because I, on a serious note, there's also environmental waste. If somebody hasn't asked for it or we don't think they'll use it, the last thing we want is to send a, a sample and have it thrown out. That's just not great for anyone. So what we are doing is if somebody, we have samples included in our checkout. So if somebody bought a product, they then can select the, on their own accord four or five samples that may correlate to their skin needs and that they're interested in. So now we know there's an interest there and it's a matching up to what they want. Um, for some of our newer products where we know somebody maybe loves our monochromatic blush and we're sampling lip, that's a good, we go back and sample to them. But again, we try and be smart on it. Um, I think it's one of the best tools a marketer can have, but it is also one of the most expensive. So it's just a trade-off. And uh, going back to understanding your, your customers, what data sources are you using to understand yours? Um, basically everything we humanly can, and that can be from publicly available data to private. So we, at least within our e-commerce ecosystem, we work with about 13 different providers, um, which is pretty normal it, it, within an e-commerce ecosystem because you want best of breed for each one. Um, but some of them are social listening tools. Some of them are, you know, as I go back to one of my favorite insights beyond, I actually every other week read all of our consumer comments on Instagram. I read every single one of them. We also do weekly uh, roundups of customer service reports. So this is emails that have come into us, phone calls. A lot of people do handwritten notes still these days. So yeah, which is kind of fun. It's almost like a surprise and delight moment. Um, so we keep a pulse on that. And then as I mentioned tool, there's some other great tools like Google. I think really understanding where, what consumers are searching for as it pertains to your brand or in the larger ecosystem of the world also helps you refine and get a sense of what's important. Great. So we have um, one last um, audience question, which I which I love because I think one of the best parts about Cover Effects is your purpose driven approach. Um, and so, with that said, the question from the audience is: Do you think your company values lead customer interest, or is it the product? That is a good question. Um, you know, I go back to what our mission is, and I will answer the question. Our mission is to bring conscious, customizable beauty to everyone. And one of the most important things for us is really being inclusive as that pertains to skin tone, skin type, that covers age, gender, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, 
I would say we're really focused on addressing our consumer needs. Products address those needs, but the consumers first. Great, and then I think we can close out with one more question, um, sure. which is really about your um, role as CEO and how you've tra transitioned from a CMO. Um, how has being a CMO prepared you for your current role and what would you suggest to marketers who are interested in making a similar transition or even those who want to better influence CEOs and CFOs? I think, great question. I feel very fortunate. My prior roles, um, whether it's been, you know, in a family-led PE-backed company at Rebecca Minkoff to being a CMO at KEDS, a global CMO, um, I was fortunate enough at KEDS to have a pretty broad remit and get exposure to a number of different areas, including product development and innovation, et cetera. Um, so I really feel like that role for the three years was a wonderful way to build and then step into the CEO role. Um, going back to some of the principles I mentioned before and what's critical, I think, for marketing leadership, whether it's someone who wants to continue to be a CMO today and just, uh, you know, have a world of limitless options or someone who's looking to go from CMO to CEO. I can't emphasize enough uh, the financial acumen piece. Um, I do think, depending on where people start their career or different companies they work at, marketing, if you're just going to summarize it at its core, is overhead or is a cost center in its purest form if there is an e-commerce attached to it. I've almost always had e-commerce attached to any of the marketing functions I've been in, so I've always done hybrid roles. It's really important, I would say, if you're trying to transition from marketing to a CEO role, that at some point you have firsthand intimate knowledge with running a PL. and um, I would say it's one of the most humbling experiences you can have, but it gives you immense perspective. And that goes back to making sure that everything you do is measurable and that builds on your relationship with your CFO that you understand, um, you know, at the end of the day, marketing is a percentage of sales. So if the sales go up, there might be more marketing. If they go down, marketing needs to come down. It's nothing personal. It's all professional. And it's based on numbers. So really understanding that uh, model, I think, is important. Um, finally, my advice beyond those pieces, dig into operations. Truly understand how does your product, whether it's a physical product or a software product, whatever it is, what are the different steps? What are the costs associated with it? What is the timing associated with it? Because if you don't have a phenomenal partnership with your head of product, or if you're not part of that, um, that is going to be a challenge for you to get to the next GM role. That's great. Well, um, I, I don't know about other students, but I definitely need to dig up my corporate finance and operations strategy. Let's do yeah. it, my friend. <laughs> yeah. um, but Emily, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. Um, even in the short amount of time that we had together, this was truly a masterclass in um, how to innovate, how to get closer to your customer, um, and how to be a leader in your organization. So um, I really appreciate you sharing all of these insights, and it's uh, really such an honor to have you in our uh, Columbia network. And so I really look forward to um, purchasing more cover effects uh, <laughs> products after this. It's great to Way to go, Farrell. Thank you. <laughs> you took the words Thank out of my mouth. <laughs> Thank you on my behalf as well, Emily, for being here. And uh, we look forward to the next time. That sounds great. Thank you guys so much. As right. always, uh, thank you for everyone listening and look forward to hearing from everyone soon. Take care.